Well, Peter and Simon have lived up to their billing of presenting us a scenario of gloom and doom. Jacob and I want to take a relatively, underline relatively, optimistic approach. Now, in the current environment, being relatively optimistic does not suggest that Europe's about to go on a dynamic growth binge and lead the world to economic recovery. All it means is that we're suggesting that the apocalypse that they propose is not going to happen. There will not be widespread defaults. There will not be widespread exits from the Eurozone. There will certainly be no breakup of the Euro, as Simon suggested in his last chart. I don't want to say that my friends and colleagues, Peter and Simon, have missed the forest for the trees, but they did present a lot of trees, and I want to return us to the forest and lay out the broad contours within which all this is taking place, which convince me that the outcome will be quite different from what they suggest, and that the apocalypse will indeed be avoided. Why do I say that, and how, in the face of all these falling trees, can I do so? Three basic reasons. First, we observe the history of the European integration project. Over its 50 plus years, it has faced repeated crises, some existential, which threatened the future of Europe itself. And every one of those crises was overcome. And indeed, out of those crises, as Jean Monnet presciently forecasts, Europe emerged stronger and moving forward. Second, we observe the evolution of the current crisis. There have been a number of stages at which the prophets of gloom and doom have told us it's a do or die moment, things are about to collapse. But Peter and Simon themselves, in Peter's remarks just now and in their brief, acknowledge that each of those crisis stages that have occurred so far have been dealt with, have been resolved, and Europe did live another day. Again, I'm not suggesting all is well, that there are no problems, but that the apocalypse will not happen. And the third reason is what underlies, we believe, the results of the past 50 plus years and each stage of the current crisis, which is the overwhelming commitment of the Europeans to Europe, which in today's terms means the Euro. And why is that? It's worth recalling. For the previous millennium, Europeans slaughtered each other. And for the previous century, they particularly slaughtered each other. I happened to make a visit to the Holocaust Museum with some teenagers over the holiday. And instructing them on that bit of fairly recent history, I think is helpful reminder why Europe has committed itself to the European integration project and why every European, even to this day, as far removed from that black history of period, still is committed to the European project. But there's a second reason beyond that underlying, and I still think formidable and indeed overwhelming, geopolitical rationale for responding to whatever crisis occurs with whatever is necessary to deal with it. And the second reason is the massive economic advantage to Europe itself, and particularly to Germany, of the creation of the Euro. Helmut Schmidt and I were very good friends for many years when he was in government and I was in government and then beyond that. And Helmut Schmidt would always rail every time our economy gets going strongly and every time our trade surplus rises and leads us to export-led growth, the damn Deutsche Mark goes through the ceiling and we're snuffed back. The Eurozone is the nirvana always sought by Helmut Schmidt. Germany has the world's largest trade surplus and a weak currency. And that is nirvana for a country whose entire mercantilist economic strategy is based on global competitiveness. And they are not about to give it up. One of our colleagues said, you have to do cost-benefit analysis on this stuff. Absolutely right. 
the benefits to German economic growth, to the level of German personal welfare, to the entire German economic model is so overwhelmingly supported by the existence of the Eurozone in its current configuration that it's an almost infinite cost, in my view, they will pay in order to keep it together and avoid any of the apocalyptic outcomes that are suggested. That analysis leads us to two rather striking but fundamental conclusions. The first is that Germany will pay essentially whatever is necessary to keep the Eurozone going. Repeat, whatever is necessary. The cost of failure would simply be too great in terms of German historical burden, the geopolitics underlying the whole integration experiment, and those massive economic benefits they now accrue. But secondly, and maybe even more controversially, that the European Central Bank will pay whatever is necessary to avoid a financial breakdown. The European Central Bank is the lender of last resort. It has repeatedly exhibited its willingness to function as lender of last resort. And in the absence of an intergovernmental mechanism that can carry out that role, which would indeed be more properly carried out by governments, but is not, and so ECB fills the gap, the ECB will do it. And my colleague Jacob has laid out chapter and verse of how they have done it, and done it quite effectively. So the political economy conclusion that we reach is that there are paymasters who will avoid the apocalypse. And we observe, and again, Peter and Simon acknowledge that in their remarks today and in their brief, that the politics within each of the European countries, both the debtors and the creditors, supports this construct. So far, in each of the countries, those who support maintenance of the euro, the austerity programs in the debtors, and the payments in Germany, those, those parties and politicians who support those outcomes have won political support, have been returned to office, or indeed a substitute government that takes a stronger view has been placed in power. And in the case of Germany, the one party that opposes the structure, the FDP, has basically been thrown out of representation and probably will disappear in the Bundestag in the next election there. So the politics supports those very strong conclusions that I've adduced. But I'd be the first to say there is an important problem. The problem is that these European governments, and particularly those that I view as the infinite paymasters, Germany and the ECB, cannot say that they will be the ultimate paymasters. In other words, there is a fundamental difference between what they have done and will continue to do versus what they can say. And the mantra with which I emerge from that dichotomy is watch what they do, not what they say. Why the dichotomy? Two reasons. First, if the creditors say that they're going to provide infinite bailouts for all time for all comers, it obviously creates the ultimate moral hazard. They cannot say they will do it because then all the pressure is off the debtors to adjust. And debtor adjustment is obviously a critical part of the resolution of the problem. So even if I'm right that the creditors will pay whatever is necessary, they cannot, they cannot enunciate or articulate that view, and therefore markets will continue to be disappointed. But there's a second reason why what they do diverges from what they say. Each of the different creditor groupings is constantly, and quite understandably, negotiating with the other creditor groupings to try to throw off the main burden of the bailouts to the others. There are four groups of creditors. The strong Northern European governments, led by Germany, but a few others. The ECB. The private lenders, the banks, who have to take haircuts as part of the process and the IMF, which has been in it before and is now, in my view, about to come back into it in a big way, which I mentioned in a moment. But you've got four groups 
who are sharing the costs of the bailouts and the rescue packages, the financial engineering, to give it more uh, uh, positive tonology. And each of them is obviously trying to throw off on the other as much of the burden as they can. And so they can't say, I'll bail out everybody, because then they weaken their negotiating position with the alternative creditor grouping. So there are two major game theoretic reasons, if you will, why the big players in the game cannot say what they, in fact, will do. And so, as I say, watch what they do, not what they say. But then that, of course, implies that markets will not hear any of the assurances they want to hear. Markets want firm statements. There's a four trillion uh, euro bazooka, or a flat statement, no more defaults, or a flat statement, no more bailouts. Whatever it may be, or to the contrary, maximum bailouts, but the, but the markets are not going to hear those words for the reasons I've indicated, even though I believe the outcomes will be as stated. And so the markets will continue to hear a cacophony of views from the various voices in Europe. The markets will therefore be uncertain and anxious, fully understandably. And volatility in the markets is likely to continue for quite some time while this process unfolds, even if, as I confidently suggest, at the end of the day, it will all work out OK. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood. Jacob and I are not suggesting that everything is all right. There are certainly lots of risks. In this scenario that I described, there could easily be miscalculation. You could let a bank run get out of hand in some country. You could fail to get ahead of it. So far, they've always done so, and I think they will continue, but one can't rule it out. In addition, and perhaps even more important for the longer run, there is really no growth strategy as part of the European response mechanism yet. A serious growth strategy needs three things. It needs the debtor countries to implement structural reform as well as budget austerity. It needs the strong northern governments led by Germany to get off the bandwagon of tightening their budgets and rather in, uh, uh, commence fiscal stimulus in their part of the Eurozone. And it needs the European Central Bank to cut its policy rates at least another 50 basis points, as well as function as lenders' last resort. And I would also quite acknowledge that Greece might be an exception to all of the above. Greece might very well default. Peter says it already has. In some sense, it has. That's a matter of language. Greece could even be forced out of the Eurozone or could choose to exit on its own. But if that were to happen, and it could, my own judgment is that it would reinforce the positive story I'm telling. Because if Greece exits the Eurozone, the results will be so traumatic for Greece, so apocalyptic for that country and its people, that the message that will send to Italians, Portuguese, Irish, and everybody else would be, you cannot possibly let that happen here. And so I would view any contagion as positive, not negative, in terms of a spillover effect at the level of the forest, aside from the trees. Now, I suspect there's going to be another big development that will add to the relatively positive story and might even get the market indicators starting to trend up over the next few weeks or months. And that is the invocation of what I've always thought of as Plan B, but I think now becomes part of the basic strategy. And that is simply a return by the Europeans to what happened in the earlier stages of the crisis two years ago, namely bringing in the rest of the world through the IMF. The IMF clearly now is rounding up a pretty large bazooka. I would estimate what they put together from borrowings from surplus countries, as well as what's already on the plate in Europe itself, will well exceed a trillion euro. It's not quite. Peter's four trillion, but I think one trillion euro at this point, and Jacob will lay out the details on that, would go pretty far toward indicating coverage for any plausibly possible crisis, and therefore restore at least some modicum of market confidence. Some people say, can the IMF raise half a trillion dollars, as it's now talking about? Strikes me that's easy. The United States won't contribute, and it should not. The money should come from the countries that are running big surpluses and are big creditors, not countries that have the world's largest budget and trade deficits, which is the United States. 
It should be the surplus and creditor countries, and that starts with China, but runs through Russia, which has said it will contribute, Brazil, which has said it will contribute, the oil exporters in the Gulf, who clearly will contribute, and a whole panoply of surplus creditor countries who I think will finance the IMF with sufficient funding to deal with the kind of needs that we now see. And that will create an important firewall, which maybe for the first time will permit the officials to get ahead of the, uh, get ahead of the curve. To be sure, the Europeans are rich enough, they should do it themselves. And my indication is that in the crunch, they have and will continue to do so. But to put it together and share the burden on the creditor side, the rest of the world, I think, has a big enough stake in the activity to come in, provide the kind of money I'm talking about, and thereby begin to put the crisis behind us. So the bottom line of all this is a basic confidence that there will be no collapse, no serial defaults, no widespread exits from the zone, and certainly no collapse of the, Europe, of the euro itself. I have absolute confidence that the Europeans will never permit that to happen. And that means they must achieve the other mode of adjustment, which is to create the fiscal union. And the many steps that they're taking already, and Peter even gave that his one, his one uh, positive star down on his chart, uh, they are moving very substantially, very forcefully, very importantly in that direction. It'll take several years to get there. It doesn't resolve the current crisis. But that is en route. A fiscal union, euro bonds, all that. When we're here in five years talking about this, I am absolutely confident all that will be in place. In the meanwhile, the financial engineering, of course, has to be adequate to get us from here to there by the time to permit that to take place. And as I suggest, I believe we know how it happens. The final question is really how such good friends and reasonable people as Peter and Simon on the one hand and Jacob and me on the other can possibly disagree on issues of this degree of importance. And I think there's a simple answer. We use different models. They and most economists, all those who criticize the creation of the euro in the first place, use some variant of optimal currency area theory which said this is not an optimal currency area. It can't work. By contrast, I, one of the very few who thought the euro was a good idea, would take place on time, would work, would succeed, would be a strong currency, all of which has been true up till this point. All of those who used that model, that used that, that came to that conclusion, used a political economy model, which said that even though it may not be an optimum currency area to start, its political determination is so strong that it will eventually evolve the conditions under which it will be an optimum currency area, and the integration exercise can come to its culmination. Now, this is by far the biggest test that that clash of theories, as well as the real-world effort to integrate Europe, has ever undergone. And this is truly an existential threat to the future of European integration. We have different models. We, therefore, have different predictions. I think it's going to come out positively, and I'll turn to my colleague Jacob to give you the details as to why. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. I guess now that Fred has already given uh, you our forest, I, I guess I'll just be very brief and concentrate on chopping down a few of the trees that uh, Peter and Simon gave you earlier. Because I think it's important to, to note that there is in their paper a couple of assertions, I would argue. Um, and I think uh, the, bigger, the big one is that fundamentally both Spain and Italy are already insolvent. Um, that is, is an assertion that I would claim is drawn out by saying that these risk premiums are not going to come down for all the reasons that Peter and Simon uh, elaborated on. Well, I actually happen to disagree with that. I don't think Italy and Spain are uh, insolvent. And I actually would also contend that the most recent uh, yield development for these countries actually suggests the opposite. Um, and that, of course, has very significant implications on the required size of the bazooka. Uh, needed, where I would contend that the, the magnitudes that Peter and Simon uh, put up are, are vastly inflated. 
I don't think we need to get anywhere near to that, which is why I obviously agree with Fred uh, on his more <coughs> conservative estimate of what is required. Uh, but I would also say that I don't believe that it is true to argue that the official sector in Europe is always the senior creditor. Uh, it is certainly the case that the ECB is a politically uh, senior creditor to all private sector, not quite the level of the uh, IMF, but certainly right below there, but more importantly, significantly above the uh, European, f um, the EFSF, or when that, comes, the, when that time comes, the ESM. Both of those will be pari passu, and I believe that if need be, and in the event that you have countries, such as right now Ireland and Portugal, that actually turn out to be implementing their uh, programs uh, <coughs> faithfully, um, that this is an entity that will take credit losses. Um, so that it will not just be ultimately the um, private sectors that will face haircuts. Um, this will not be politically pleasant for the ma major contributing countries uh, in, in question, but as Fred said, given the alternative, uh, this is uh, what I think will happen. So when the authors ask, who will fund Ireland after 2013, uh, when they're supposed to go back to the markets? Well, I think it's already obvious. It would be the Euro area, provided that Ireland, as well as Portugal, continue to have a clean bin of health uh, on their program implementation. Um, I also have a bit of a bone to pick with the assertions about the relevance of target two balances. Uh, I, I won't go into the details of why I think it's a particularly flawed indicator, but I will just say that it is uh, asserted that there is this massive capital and flight of deposits uh, out of the countries, the peripheral countries. Now that is true in Greece. There's no doubt about that. As it's stated, it go, uh, the, um, Deposits have come down in the Greek banking sector by about 25 to 30 percent. It is arguably also true in Ireland, where they, uh, up until early this year, came down by about 15 percent. Since then, they've actually been stable. But it is not true that it, it has been uh, taken place in Portugal and, more importantly, of course, Italy and Spain. What, what the target two imbalances basically suggest is that private banks have stopped lending to the periphery so that the external capital needs of these countries are now covered through the central bank. Well, I wouldn't consider that to be a crisis symptom. I consider that essentially kind of a shock absorber. Uh, and in fact, a sign that the monetary union is indeed working. And I think we need to be clear that the only, it is true that the European Central Bank has adopted, has taken on a lot more credit risk, but it is not credit risk that come from these target two balances. It comes from changing the collateral uh, requirements for its repo operations, as well as, of course, extending now unlimited three-year loans. The only, in fact, explicit uh, risk from a target two uh, imbalance, uh, as, as uh, was shown, which uh, right now shows that the Bundesbank has a massive uh, uh, deficit, is that if a central bank from a peripheral country chooses to leave, and is then uh, quits the euro and is not able to repay. Now that is a target two related risk, uh, which will, as the authors say, be spread out uh, among the uh, euro area as a whole. But, but it is not, as I said, ultimately the target two, in my opinion, has actually been a shock absorber. Um, and then I would also uh, contend that the politics, as Fred said, are far more stable uh, than uh, anybody or certainly that Simon asserted in the end. Because again, as Simon said, if you look at how Europeans actually vote, you know, they don't vote for populists. In fact, Spain, Ireland, Portugal, the three uh, pro, or the two program countries and one additional peripheral country that actually has had these elections have overwhelmingly voted for the opposite. And these are not two party systems where you just kick out the incumbent. You actually had an, you had an alternative. The Irish could have voted for Sinn Féin. They didn't. The Portuguese could have voted for the far left, as could the Spanish. They could also have voted for regional parties. They didn't. They actually voted for the parties who pretty much uh, goes for a, a, a platform of more austerity as well as more structural reform. 
And I will predict, unlike uh, Simon, that this will happen, or this will continue. Because the main thing here is that I, would, I don't subscribe to the pendulum theory that this is going to continue for another five years. People are going to get fed up, and then they're going to vote back the old guard. Because this is, this is in my opinion, a, a misleading analogy. Uh, the analogy is what happened in Northern Europe in the 80s and 90s, where essentially you had a massive shift to the center by the mainstream socialist and social democratic parties in these countries where they basically ditched, if you like, the sort of utopian welfareist uh, um, uh, policies that they had. Nobody today, I believe, can claim that the German Social Democrats, the Dutch Social Democrats, or the, or the Scandinavian Social Democrats are fiscally or even structurally uh, uh, non-market oriented or unsustainable parties. So even if you have a change of government next time in Spain, the next Span the, the, you know, the, the Spanish Socialist Party is quite different today than what it was uh, before the crises. So basically, this is a, a lasting shift that I predict will, uh, will continue, which is also why, again, uh, as Fred said, the politics of this uh, are far more sustainable than what uh, is frequently asserted. Um, and I would finally just say that there's no doubt that the growth outlook in the short term in Europe is quite is quite bleak. It has come down a lot. Um, we are likely in the euro area right now in a short, uh, in my opinion, short and shallow recession. I don't believe that we're going to, we're looking at another, you know, 2009 here, however. Um, so I have to say that in that lens, with, you know, the euro area's growth problems are overwhelmingly structural, which means that you know, for, for those who say, well, we need to re-stimulate the economy, and I will leave Germany and some of the northern European countries out here, but those who say that we really need to re-stimulate right away, I, I will just say that, do we really believe that a country like Italy can sustainably grow when it has the demographics that it has and a 50% female labor force participation? I, I personally don't think that that's a sustainable model, which is why it doesn't, in, in fact, uh, in my opinion, uh, make a lot of sense to try to reflate now when the, um, uh, when the structural reform programs have not yet uh, played out. Now, this does mean that I certainly, as Fred said, don't predict a you know, uh, rapid economic growth in Europe going, uh, going forward in the next uh, couple of years. But on the other hand, I do believe that Europe, for the first time, has the political economy chance of actually raising its long-term potential growth rate uh, which is really what we should be caring about, uh, not uh, the, the short-term outlook. Uh, and I think, I think I'll end there in the interest of, um, of time. Okay, Thank let's you. all take up here.